uh, the mics are on, huh? And uh, welcome everyone to uh, our first uh, plenary session, our first session, uh, working session of the conference. I'm Jim Fine, the uh, Legislative Secretary for Foreign Policy at the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And it is my great privilege to this year be the chairman. I as often say clerk of the board, I can't lose my Quaker terminology, the chairman of the board of Churches uh, for Middle East Peace. And it's my uh, special pleasure this morning to be able to introduce uh, our first session, Regional Conflicts, Challenges, and Solutions. Many of us have come to this conference and to this concern through a special involvement with the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian conflict but I think we all know that our concern for Israeli-Palestinian peace takes place in a regional context, both of uh, dynamics within the region and uh, of a U.S. policy that has uh, a regional outlook. Um, I think our president uh, on Thursday in Cairo made that very clear when he spoke about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, about Iran, about Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, uh, it's all tied together. And this um, fact, I think, was brought home for me very clearly back in December of 2006. I had just begun work for the French Committee on National Legislation, and we were anxiously awaiting the publication of the Iraq Study Group Report. Uh, co-chaired uh, by Lee Hamilton and Jim Baker, former Indiana Congressman and former Secretary of State. And that bipartisan commission had a surprise, I think, for those of us uh, who have come to these concerns primarily through the Israel-Palestine conflict. The report said the U.S. cannot achieve its objectives in the region unless it addresses the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, that was a bit of a surprise in a report about Iraq, but I think from that time it has been increasingly clear that there is a strong sentiment within this country that sees these issues holistically and very much interrelated. Uh, an obscure first-term uh, senator just a month after the Iraq study group uh, report was published introduced uh, a bill in the Senate to implement the recommendations of the Iraq Study Group report. And of course that senator was Barack Obama. Uh, and if you had asked me, does this man have any chance to become president then, I would have said, no way, uh, not in a million years. But uh, there I think we saw the first sign of President Obama's strategic vision uh, of U.S. relations uh, to the region. And I think as we listen to what was said in Cairo and see the administration moving forward on Israel, Palestine, and other issues, uh, that the thinking behind the Iraq Study Group report is very much uh, in his mind. Our speakers today uh, have uh, a relation of one sort or another to the Iraq Study Group report. Uh, Shibli Telhami, who is the Anwar Sadat Professor for uh, Peace and Development at the University of Maryland College Park, was a member of one of the working groups that produced the Iraq Study Group report. Uh, Shibley is a close associate of Churches for Middle East Peace. And you have uh, his and Treaty's biography in your pamphlet, so I won't go into detail, but Shibley is also a member uh, of our CMAP uh, advisory council, actually leadership council, uh, and we have seen him uh, on many podia before and are glad to have him with us today. Trita Farsi, uh, I say, is related to the Iraq Study Group report because Trita and the National um, Iranian American Council, of which she is the president, has been working assiduously uh, ever since and actually before that report was published uh, to um, persuade the United States to engage with Iran as the Iraq Study Group um, report recommended. And Trita is also a very close associate of many of us in CMET. Many of us are also members of an organization called Campaign for a New American Policy on Iran, some of the same organizations that support CMET uh, support Sanafi. And I would say that NIAC, the National Iranian American Council, is the indispensable organization for that coalition. Uh, both their uh, expertise and guidance uh, and the political uh, clout that they bring to bear are essential for that interrelated effort. So, uh, without uh, 
Any further introduction, we're going to have first Shipley speak for a few minutes, uh, and then Trina, and then we will take your questions. And I think as I speak, members of the CMAP staff will be circulating through the audience, giving out uh, little 3 by 5 index cards on which you can write your questions, and then they'll bring them up here uh, so our guests can ask them. Uh, Shibley and Trina, thank you very much for being with us, uh, and please, Shibley. Should we speak from here, from the table? Uh, as the most uh, comfortable and convenient, right? Yeah, one stage. Uh, good morning. It's a, a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, it's a wonderful organization that uh, I support, and uh, uh, I'm happy to support its mission. And uh, uh, I thought what I'd do this morning is uh, put in perspective uh, a little bit of where uh, the United States is in its relationship with the broader Middle East. Uh, and I think in some ways to use the President's speech in Cairo uh, and uh, put some uh, kind of context, put it in some kind of context uh, based on my annual Arab Public Opinion Poll, which I just conducted or released it uh, in, in May. Um, and, and we have a pretty good sense every year of how uh, uh, at least the public in the Middle East uh, is changing its attitude to the United States. But more than that, uh, what the issues are for the public in the region. What, what are they focused on? What are their perspectives? Um, and remember that, that when, when the president went to Cairo, this address to the Muslim world, although he, remember, he didn't even mention the term Muslim world because he understood that there was a diversity of communities, diversity of opinion. He, 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 he didn't want to play into the hands of those who wanted to project it as a monolithic, uh, unified uh, region. Uh, but the, the aim of the, the speech was to reach out to people, not the governments. Uh, understanding that the United States is dealing with governments, has to deal with governments, clearly uh, has strategic mission in working with governments in the region, particularly for the key strategic objectives the United States faces. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, there was a clear understanding that the public uh, is in a different place than most governments in the region and that the public in, in, in our Muslim countries matters, even authoritarian countries, matters a lot. It matters a lot, and not only for persuading governments to come on board, uh, but also for, uh, in, in a way, reducing the militancy that has been uh, threatening to American interests, uh, and also for uh, implementing the strategic objective of the United States. When you look at the United States and the Middle East, uh, the broader Middle East, the greater Middle East has been defined, um, you see that we have, of all the major objectives that this country faces, uh, aside from the economy, which obviously is the overwhelming uh, priority uh, uh, above all else, but if you take that aside, uh, you, you know, the United States engaged in two wars still. Uh, difficult ones, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan slash Pakistan. Uh, there is the issue that is very important for the political elites in this country, and, and this uh, administration is forced to address uh, nuclear proliferation broadly, but particularly the one uh, pertaining to Iran. Uh, and there is the Arab-Israeli issue, which uh, all the polls I've been conducting year after year indicates remains what I call the prism of pain, the prism of pain through which Arabs view America. It's the central uh, prism through which people make evaluations of American foreign policy broadly. Uh, it's not that if you resolve the Arab and the conflict, you resolve everything else. It's not that it's the cause of, of uh, 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 all the conflict in the Middle East, but it is the psychological prism through which most people make an evaluation. Just to give you an example, uh, during uh, the campaign uh, in, uh, uh, in last year, during our own presidential campaign, uh, I made several trips to the Middle East, to different countries, uh, actually Middle East and Asia, well, Arab and Muslim countries. Um, and it, it, it was uh, fascinating to see how many people uh, were interested in American elections. This was, a, this was an election that captured the imagination of much of the world, as you know. Uh, and people did want to know about you know, uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton and McCain, uh, I spoke more about the American elections than about any other issue while I was uh, speaking across Arab and Muslim countries. Uh, and the first question I would be asked in almost every place when they want to know uh, about the candidate is not what they're going to do about democracy. 
is not what they're going to do about economic aid. It's not what they're going to do about Iran. Uh, it is what they're going to do about terrorism relations. Uh, that was instinctively, of course, it was interesting because that included a trip to a, um, a region in Saudi Arabia where there are a concentration of Shia. And I went into a dissident uh, house, a Shia dissident house, who had a kind of an intellectual salon where he had a, uh, uh, a lot of uh, other Shia intellectuals, men and women, by the way. There were also women in there in, in his big basement. Uh, uh, and uh, and I was very surprised that the majority of the questions that were addressed to me were about the Arab Israel issue and when it came to the American candidates, uh, above all else, more than Iran or Iraq or, or, or democratization. So the Arab Israel issue remains, I think, the prism through which uh, Arabs see the world. So when you look at the agenda of this administration in foreign policy, a lot of the core issues uh, have to do have to be, do, do with the Middle East and, and with the world, and so it's not a surprise that the uh, the president has put so much effort into it uh, and has announced it from day one as a priority issue and put so much effort into this speech. The question is, where is the public on these issues? The public that he's been trying to win over. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to review with you uh, some of the positions of the public on on the core issues. Uh, and uh, some of the positions uh, toward the U.S. and toward the new administration. Uh, in, in many ways, even before the president gave the power speech, uh, there was already a lot of openness to him, and the sort of openness that we have not seen uh, in a long time, uh, but that had not translated into a transformative uh, view of, uh, of the United States. And, and let me just go through some of the examples. First, uh, in terms of the, the opinion of the President of the United States. Um, I, every year, uh, you know, I have a, an open question in my poll that uh, asks the public in uh, uh, the six Arab countries where I poll, um, uh, who, uh, whom they admire most of all world leaders and whom they dislike most of all world leaders. The most striking thing over the past several years has been that, um, really since the Iraq War, since 2003, uh, the most disliked leader in the world, selected by a majority in every country that I hold, was George W. Bush. Uh, and by the way, he, was, he trumped the Israeli Prime Minister for a long time. Uh, we had the Israeli Prime Minister being number one. It was, it was actually Ariel Sharon, and then uh, even Omer emerged. Uh, but, but uh, uh, President Bush uh, was the most disliked leader to the past several years. Actually, he showed up in April, May of this year after he left office killed as the most disliked leader. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, people have been forgotten. Um, now, that's why I think it's very important to understand the attitudes toward President Obama. When you ask them whether they have a favorable or unfavorable view of, the United, uh, of President Obama, uh, there, there are uh, some striking things. First, that a, a significant plurality and a majority in several countries have a positive view of it. That is extraordinary, particularly when you consider what I just said. Um, in Saudi Arabia, 79% uh, of the public have a somewhat positive view of the President of the United States. Uh, those who have negative views are a minority in every country except for Jordan. Uh, uh, in, in all the countries, uh, uh, including Egypt, uh, those who have a negative view of them are about roughly about a quarter. Uh, so uh, it, it's a remarkable openness, a remarkable openness to it. Uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, still uh, a, a small plurality and a positive view of them, but there are also a lot of neutrals. Uh, there, there's a large, a large segment of the public that is neutral about it. So there's not a majority that has a positive view of him, but a, a plurality, but, but a lot of people have a neutral view of him. They still have a, 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 an open, open mind, but, but they haven't made up their mind yet. And I think that uh, uh, in Jordan and Egypt, my own view is that their uh, soft uh, feelings toward him are largely a function of the Gaza War. Those are the two countries that were mostly affected by it. They were all 
uh, focused on the fact that not much has happened in Gaza despite all the promises, uh, and the Gaza was driving their hard views of, of the U.S. So that there is a, a sense that uh, uh, the U.S. hasn't done enough on Gaza, and, and including the Obama administration. That, that's uh, one reason why you don't have the kind of enthusiasm as in, in many countries. But what's also striking is that uh, there's no love affair with uh, Those who say they have a very positive view of them are few. We're talking about 11% who have a very positive view of them. Those who have a positive view of them only have a somewhat positive view of them. So don't translate that into a love affair with them. In fact, uh, uh, in another indication of that it's not a love affair, in my open question, in which I don't mention any names, where I ask, name uh, the, the leader in the world that you admire most, uh, uh, President Obama really doesn't show up. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the for the past two years, the most admired leader in the Arab world had been uh, Hassan al-Sarla, the leader of Hezbollah. Uh, the, the two years uh, before that, the three years before that, was Jacques Chirac of France, uh, as a consequence of his, uh, uh, per the perception that he stood up to Bush on the Iraq war that drove their views. Hassan al-Sarla became popular after the 2006 war. But this year, his numbers declined in the confrontation, with, particularly with Egypt and, and, and Morocco. Uh, and uh, Hugo Chavez is number one. <laughs> Perception of, of 20, over 20% of the Arab public. Uh, President Obama doesn't show up as one of the most admired leaders in the Arab world. So don't misunderstand. They have, uh, they're open to him. They have positive view of him. But they're not in love with him. And back in uh, last year in, in, uh, um, in the poll that I conducted in uh, uh, in April of 2008, uh, I asked them about the views of the American candidates that were still alive. That was Obama, Clinton, and McCain. And I asked the question, uh, 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 which candidate they thought would be best for advancing Middle East peace. And it was interesting. The results really were, were interesting in and of themselves even then, because Obama was, uh, you know, in, in, in many ways, when you ask people, do you think Obama could get elected, uh, uh, they would say impossible. They couldn't even imagine uh, uh, the American people electing someone like Barack Obama. And it just, it, it just went against the view of America. It just didn't. Uh, I can't tell you how many people thought I was a fool uh, when I was speaking out there. Uh, the intellectual experts in Egypt or Riyadh or Kuala Lumpur I would be saying, they would ask me, do you think this man could get elected? Because they knew I was helping his campaign. I said, yes, I, I truly believe that the, our country is ready for him. said, you're, you're a fool. You don't understand your own country. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 this, this, was a common, this was a common thing. And yet, and yet, you hear, they have an opinion of them. Uh, they have an opinion of them. They know that uh, he's different from what they expect America to be. Uh, and yet, when I asked them, um, who do you think would advance the least peace most? Uh, he was leading, but only 18% said he had a better chance. 30% said Hillary Clinton. You know, that's not far behind when you consider the margin of error. And only 4% said McCain, but the plurality, the largest number of people said it wouldn't make a difference. America is America. And by the way, I think that part of the debate that is going on in the minds of the public now uh, is uh, uh, you know, it, it's a debate whether it's Obama's America or America's Obama. They, they're kind of, they're not sure whether they should change their mind about Obama or they should change their mind about America. And and that's kind of where they're caught right now. That's that's really where the debate is in the Arab world. That, that's where the confusion is about where where this is at. Uh, let me let me just change two issues. Now, with all of this uh, in the background, um, I asked them. Uh, after the first few months of Obama in office, uh, uh, are you more hopeful or are you more pessimistic or, or are you neutral about uh, America's role in the Middle East? Uh, surprisingly, it's like majority overall, over 50%, uh, say they're more hopeful about American policy. And that's amazing, actually, when you consider that. The, the hopefulness that you have here is really quite striking. And just to give you an indication, when we ask the question about 
one of the issues that's happened more early on for them in, in changing their views, not just that Obama got elected, that's one, but really about what he did. And there are very interesting issues that matter to them. Uh, number one, uh, Iraq. The fact that he declared that he's going to pull out of Iraq, very popular. Uh, that, that, that basically that indicated to them that he was going to follow through with his commitment in the campaign. Very important. That shows actually that's the single most important thing that he did in the first few months that, that got their attention. Uh, declaration of intent to close one animal and torture. Uh, I can't tell you how important that ends up being in, in the Middle East because that is not just about uh, talking the talk and walk and the walk as the problem was for the Bush administration, the credibility issue, but it was also because most people in the region see it as oriented towards them. They see, they saw one harm, one torture as basically aimed at them. Uh, and they saw them as humiliating. And, and in that sense, uh, it's made a big difference to uh, for the president to move in that. The appointment of uh, George Mitchell was well received, but people are still skeptical about the early moves on the Arab-Israeli issue. Uh, the fact the president has uh, uh, talked to them uh, that this is a priority issue uh, to him matters, but uh, they're still skeptical about any moves on the ground because they don't see much change in Gaza particularly. And uh, the language of respect that he said he's using, uh, the fact that he uh, spoke to them uh, with a different tone matters as well, and we see that in the uh, we see that in the polls. So those are the things that have made a difference early on. But where they haven't made a difference is, or uh, they haven't made a big difference, they've made some difference, not a big difference, uh, is in their attitudes toward American foreign policy broadly. Uh, one, just to give you one or two examples, no, no more. Uh, one is their attitudes toward, uh, I, I ask a question every year. I ask them to name the two countries that pose the biggest threats to them an open question. They can name any country they want in the world. Uh, and this would be interesting to treat them because, you know, we, we talk a lot about the Iranian threat and, and obviously many Arab governments see Iran as a threat and, and maybe the biggest threat. Um, but in my own public opinion poll, uh, consistently every year, uh, over 70 percent, actually last year over 80 percent of the public uh, identified Israel first and the United States second as the two most threatening states. I mean, that, that actually is really quite telling about what happened over the past eight years, because it used to be that they had an unfavorable view of the United States, but the view that America is the biggest threat is, is a relatively new, new notion. And so, uh, out of, uh, last year, I believe it was 88% identified the United States as, the, as one of the two biggest threats. Only, last year was only about 10 or 11% who identified Iran as one of the two biggest threats. This year, um, the, the, the number of people identified the U.S. dropped to 77 percent. Very, very tiny drop, but still, 77 percent of Americans that our public identified uh, the U.S. as one of the two biggest threats to them. And uh, Iran uh, was identified by 20 percent this year. Uh, that's an increase over last year. There's an indication, there are other indications that the uh, campaign that is being waged by Egypt and Morocco particularly, and to some extent by Saudi Arabia, having some impact uh, on the margins, but it hasn't really transformed the broader picture, which is that most Arabs broadly, and the Arab public, including in Saudi Arabia, interestingly, does not see Iran as the biggest threat to them. They're not as obsessed with Iran, or for that matter with Iran's nuclear uh, power, uh, as the government are. So that, that, that is an interesting uh, point. Uh, let me just go over uh, some of the views on the issues uh, that matter uh, most to them, to, that is to, to uh, our public. Uh, on Iraq, um, uh, the majority of our public want to see American forces out of Iraq. Uh, and uh, in fact, that has emerged as, in some ways, uh, as important, if not more important in the view of some uh, than the Arab Israeli issue. Uh, uh, that, that is a very popular, uh, very popular position. Uh, on um, Iran's uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the change from last year is last year uh, the vast majority of people, well, a majority of people, thought that if Iran were to acquire nuclear weapons, 
it would actually be better for the region. Uh, and then I'm talking about arrows, okay? So uh, th th that would be actually better for the region to run with that water the water. This year, it's plurality it, 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 uh, thinks that it would actually be worse for the region, but, but it's not a huge difference, but the, the, there is a little bit of a difference. But what's interesting is that in all the Arab countries, including Lebanon, Lebanon we, we, we have a new election in Lebanon that uh, just uh, in essence retained the status quo uh, in, in Lebanon. Uh, but in every, among every single group in Lebanon, including Christians, and Druze, uh, Sunnis, Shia, uh, most people think that Iran has the right to this nuclear program and the international community should not oppress Iraq if Iran to strong this nuclear program. It's very interesting uh, how they do that. On the Arab-Israeli issue, um, two-thirds of the public in the Arab world of the third to accept the two-state solution based on the 1967 war. But 50%, 50%, in some countries, a large majority, do not believe it will ever happen. So in fact, they've just given up on it. And, and that's why, in a way, you can, you can have people who are in principle open to peace but support militancy as a matter of, of, of fact. And most of those who think it will never happen say, and it'll never happen because they think the Israelis will never will never accept it. Uh, I should say here that uh, in some of the polls among Israelis and Palestinians, you, there is also a mirror image where uh, the Israeli public also, which is supportive of the two-state, also doesn't think the other side wants it, and so you have this hardened hard dynamic. Uh, on the Palestinian political uh, divisions, you're going to hear that you have a session at noon to talk specifically about the Arab-Israeli issue. Um, but here are some of the uh, 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 survey results. Um, uh, first, the vast majority of Arabs in every country want to see a Palestinian national unity government uh, across the board in every country, in every group. They want to see a Palestinian national unity government. Uh, however, uh, of those who want one faction to rule, uh, either Fatah or Hamas, uh, more people want to see Hamas rule than Fatah. And that is true in every country. Uh, so uh, we have to understand that. I think it's something that is not clear in our own uh, discourse here in this country, that that is the reality in the, um, uh, in, uh, in the uh, Arab world. Uh, just to conclude, um, I think that um, if, you, if you read um, or if you have heard the President's speech in Cairo, uh, there were a couple of things that were very important. Uh, one, obviously, is this, uh, the tone. The tone has been extremely important, and it does matter, and we know it matters. The tone of mutual respect and frankness. He's been frank with them. And in a way, he's been frank, uh, this so-called moral equivalency that we hear about, which is, uh, you know, equating the Palestinian question with the Israeli question has been criticized here for uh, elevating the Palestinian issue to the level of the Israeli cause, which hasn't been the case. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's actually, in his audience in the Middle East, it actually works against them, uh, because they see moral equivalency working the other side. They say, you're equating the occupied and the occupier. Uh, and, and so while here he gets criticism, he gets criticism there too, and there are a lot of people who are really criticizing him on moral equivalency between the occupied and the occupier. So we have to keep in mind that this is really part of the frankness that he's doing. It's not that he's scoring, but he's not pandering, because it's out there, it's actually working against him. It's actually more of, of the frankness element. But beyond the tone, this speech was a little bit different than the other speeches in that he started to lay out the issues that matter to them. And uh, on the issues, he, he touched on the Iraq issue, the Arab-Israeli issue, uh, the Afghanistan-Pakistan issue, although, by the way, that's not as big as the Arab world. It's big in other Muslim countries, but not so much in the Arab world. Uh, and he touched on human rights and democracy, issues that matter to the public, but that have, uh, where the public lost interest after the past eight years, and he has to win them back on these, uh, on these issues. Uh, I think what we see now, though, is that um, in, in some ways the speech accomplished its job in that it started changing the discourse framing the questions in, in, in different language, uh, in, 
starting a conversation in the Arab world, starting a conversation in Israel, starting a conversation here, a genuine debate, the likes of which we haven't seen in a long time. Uh, it has um, uh, worked in the sense that after the speech, more people are listening, not less people are listening. The worst thing you want to have is a speech that says, we've heard this before, and then start tuning out, as happened with, with the Bush administration. It's all about credibility, and every speech has to build on that credibility. You don't want a speech to lose your credibility uh, more than the speech before. But that raises the stakes, particularly when you lay out issues like you did. And in the end, while tone matters a lot, discourse matters a lot, framing of issues matter a lot, it's, it's, they're essential. In the end, everyone knows it's about delivery of goods. And the challenges are enormous, and I think that in many ways this administration has already made it clear that its credibility by the end of the president's first term uh, is going to depend on the extent to which this administration will get the region closer to a two-state solution. This is a two-state solution administration, and if the Middle East is closer to two states by the end of this term, they will have succeeded. If the Middle East is farther away from it, they will have failed. And frankly, if this president fails, I hate to think of the consequences, but if this president, with this kind of commitment, with this kind of openness in the region, the two-state solution are run, is running out of time in any case, if it fails, uh, I think it probably will be the end of the two-state solution as an option uh, for peace in the Middle East. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just let us know when will we be able to hear the results of the next poll that you conduct in the Arab world that will reflect the Cairo speech uh, and developments up to that point. Uh, I'm going to be conducting a small one in July um, of, of next month, but the, the annual public opinion poll is, is an annual public opinion, so, so uh, it wouldn't happen until next April. And we'll be on the lookout for the results in July. Thank you, and treat it. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure being here. Uh, and I think particularly mindful of what should be just said about if this president, if this president cannot make it, then we wouldn't want to even think about the consequences. And that makes the work that you guys are doing all the more important because it means that this is not the time to go on vacation and thinking, wow, we got the right president in the office, everything will be fine. He will not be able to succeed without the help of organizations such as yours. I'm very grateful to be able to be here to talk to you about the issues that we all care so much about. I'm going to laser in a little bit more on Iran, uh, which I think is the, the second very, very big dimension of uh, whether President Obama will be succeeding in the Middle East or not. Uh, the connections that oftentimes were invisible between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and U.S.-Iran relations have become more and more visible as of late. And I think particularly when the President is saying that he's seeking a comprehensive uh, approach and solution to the region, it's not a good sign, but it's actually reality. You either succeed in almost every front in the Middle East, you don't have to go exactly simultaneously, but progress in one issue will enable progress in another issue. Failure in one issue will make more difficulties for other issues, and neglect of one important issue can be a disaster for all the other issues. That's why the President has to go forward on all fronts at the same time, which is exactly what he's doing, and that is a very, very hard job. Now, on Iran, uh, if I could just sum up where we essentially stand with the president having been in office for a couple of months now. And I think we have to credit the president for having unilaterally changed the atmosphere between the United States and Iraq. It's not as if the Iraq has been particularly helpful in helping to change this atmosphere. On the contrary, they've been very, very cautious and at times negative. But they're also um, preoccupied with their own political season and they're going to have elections on Friday. But I'll get back to that in a while. The President made a couple of very, very important statements. Uh, and I think the Nauru's message, uh, the Rani Nui message that he sent out on March 20th, was quite groundbreaking, in which he took several steps to inject much-needed trust and confidence into the process of negotiations between the United States and Iran. And I think also signaled his strategic intent. 
in that speech, he consistently referred to Iran as the Islamic Republic of Iran, signaling that he is not seeking regime change as the Bush administration was, which made progress on any issue between the United States and Iran almost impossible. Because why would the Iranians collaborate with the U.S., even in areas of common interest, such as Afghanistan, if the ultimate objective of the United States was to overthrow them? But he's been consistently saying Islamic Republic of Iran, trying to put that fear uh, to rest, without, I have to emphasize, without in any shape or form giving up on the idea of democracy in Iran. And it's very important to make a distinction here between democracy in Iran and U.S.-sponsored regime change. They, in fact, contradict each other oftentimes. Um, beyond that, he talked about uh, how the relations between the United States and Iran, the many problems that exist, cannot be resolved through threats alone, which is, of course, the probably can get in indicating that uh, the military option is not very high on the agenda or even on the table. He indicated that Iran has a rightful role in uh, the community of nations, which is a very, very important point. Because the Iranians are not seeking just some security guarantees from the United States or better economic relations. The Iranians view themselves as a major player in the region that currently is isolated and excluded from almost every um, decision-making body in the region. The Iranians essentially lack any legitimate avenues for influence which is part of the reason why they're relying so heavily on avenues that we would call illegitimate. By bringing Iran in, including it into the political economic structures of the region and giving it, recognizing the role that it has, uh, that is a very important objective of the Iranians. And for the president to recognize that a country of the size of Iran, with the influence of Iran, needs to have a recognized role in the region, uh, was very, very important to inject that type of a trust that is needed. Now, a lot of people have been very disappointed, and myself included, that the Iranian response so far has been very tame. Um, and uh, I think we have to take a look at how they are viewing this. I think the Iranians have gone from a position in which they were kind of confused. They didn't really know what to make of this. How could this president suddenly a win, mindful of the fact that his name is the same, um, and then come in and so quickly try to transform things. There's been a lot of suspicions. Is this a trick? Um, uh, is this just something that the president is doing in order to be able to justify harsher measures down the road? And I think increasingly, the Iranians have started to become convinced that the president is not only serious, he is serious in seeking a strategic deal with the Iranians, not just a tactical reduction of tensions. And that's very important. But what they're not being convinced of is that Washington is serious. They buy the sincerity of the president more and more because what he's doing on Iran is consistent with what he's doing in the Middle East. It's consistent with what he's doing in Latin America. But they're not convinced yet of the sincerity of Washington. If you take a look at the speeches that the Supreme Leader in Iran has been given in regards to Obama's outreach, the first one, only 24 or so hours after that speech, had a very important sentence in it, in which he asked himself, we don't even know who is making decisions in Washington. Is it the President? Is it Congress? Or is it shady characters in, uh, in the background? I'm paraphrasing approximately what he said. And um, it is not a surprise. At the end of the day, it's the same question that some people in this city is asking themselves. Because the language and the message coming out of the president's office, coming out of the NSC, is very consistent, very constructive, and has that element of vision to it. That is not necessarily the case when it comes to some of the statements coming out of the State Department, uh, or out of the UN ambassador uh, up in New York. And mindful of the fact that we're at a stage right now, and both sides are seeking to understand, is the other side sincere, and is the other side capable of delivering? Consistency of message is absolutely critical. And here, surprisingly, the Iranians, who usually are not very consistent, have been quite consistent. Now, uh, Congress is of tremendous importance because there has been a, a 
flurry of new sanctions legislation being introduced. Uh, and some members of Congress have been pushing very hard to get those sanctions passed as quickly as possible. The White House has come out against that, recognizing that in this very sensitive stage in which the two countries are trying to find their way to the negotiating table, any imposition of new sanctions would undermine the atmosphere and the trust that the President has so carefully sought to build up. And he can unfortunately end up in a situation in which negotiations don't take place at all. And I'm mentioning that because it's very, very, very critical right now. The Iranians are having elections in four days. It's quite unprecedented if the president were to lose a re-election bid. That's never happened in the Islamic Republic so far. But the type of excitement, the level of excitement that is currently being seen in Tehran and other cities, the engagement by the public, is becoming almost higher than it was when Khatani won his elections in 1997 and completely surprised the entire political establishment in Iran. And it's going to be very difficult for any of the challengers of Ahmadinejad to win a majority in the first round. But if they manage to make sure that Ahmadinejad does not win a majority, then chances are that Musavi, who is the front runner against Ahmadinejad, will no longer be the underdog in the second round, which will be on that June 19th, but it will actually be the front runner. Because the vast majority of the votes that will go either for another reformist, Karoubi, or for a conservative, Rezai, will actually go to Ahmadinejad. You've seen, you're seeing this unprecedented coalition of conservatives, reformists, and centrists all coming together against Ahmadinejad. Now that's happening on Friday. Guess what's happening tomorrow in Congress? The House leadership has put the Iran Enabling Sanctions Act on the suspension calendar, which means that it is considered a very non-controversial bill. It will pass through without uh, even counting the vote votes. Imagine what that will do. Because if there's anything that we want from the Bush years, is that computational policies on our end do not help the moderates. They help the radicals. And four days before an election in Iran, if the U.S. Congress passes by voice on suspension council, another set of sanctions against Iran, it may actually tilt the election in favor of Ahmadi. So on that note, I'll end it and leave it you. Thank you very much, Trina. That's uh, a sobering note and a very big surprise. I should mention that while Christian Sermilli's piece has been up lobbying primarily on Israel-Palestine issues, uh, a year ago when a resolution was introduced which we called the blockade resolution, which would have uh, instructed the then President Bush to do everything that he could to impose a blockade uh, of gasoline products and other uh, things on Iran. CMS was an, um, uh, one of a number of organizations, including those that we work with closely, uh, that went to work and lobbied successfully uh, against bringing that resolution to a vote, even though it had uh, a high number of co-sponsors. Uh, this comes very quickly. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much any of our member organizations can do in the time remaining, but certainly doing um, whatever we can to block that vote would uh, be very important. Okay, questions are coming up. Let me, let me uh, while I'm waiting for the questions to arrive um, at the front desk, just ask one about time frames for both of you. Uh, on Iran, uh, at his press conference with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, a few weeks ago, uh, President Obama deflected the uh, calls that we have heard in Congress to allow negotiations with Iran to go on, negotiations which haven't started yet, for only two or three months within which Iran would have to suspend its uranium uh, enrichment or the negotiations would be declared a failure and other steps should be taken. President Obama laid out another time frame, a, a general vague one, uh, till the end of the year to see some kind of progress. Um, is that a reasonable time frame? And then on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what kind of a timetable are we operating on 
within which we would have to see some results or we will see expectations in the region and elsewhere begin to decline on relief for Gaza, on the settlement freeze, or other things. How much time do we have to concert our lobby efforts to try to make uh, a critical difference? Uh, first, a little bit of clarification on what the president said about the Iran hostage. I mean, uh, uh, he said, I am not for an artificial deadline. Uh, and he didn't say the end of the year as a deadline. He said, uh, basically, uh, you know, I, he's not going in with an endless, you know, he doesn't clearly, the issue was that would, would the Iranian government exploit the negotiations just by time to develop uh, device and and his position was obviously he doesn't want that to happen so he's going to make an assessment and so he talked about it in the context of uh, you know watching the negotiations to see if promises be made he did it with the president in the presence of the Israeli prime minister uh, there was a sense that uh, the prime minister needed something uh, particularly as the president made the settlement issue a very top priority issue for him and pressed the prime minister on it. Uh, that he would give him something uh, a lot less than what Netanyahu you know, asked for, but at least some some kind of uh, 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 gesture on, on the Iran issue. So I don't see that as a, as a, as a deadline in the same sense as uh, what is being talked about in, in, in the press. Um, on the Palestinian-Israeli issue, um, look, uh, the problem isn't just that we need uh, you know some ending to this conflict, but at least some it's not the implementation of agreement, some kind of agreement where people stop believing that uh, the conflict is coming to an end. Uh, that, that's necessary, and I think this administration, in, in the report that I co-authored for the Council on Foreign Relations of Brookings, uh, about the Palestinian israeli conflict specifically, I said this will be the last administration to have the option of dealing with a two-state solution. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I think the, the time is running out, both because of the change in the ground, but, but even more because people are bailing out of the two-state solution. The psychological environment is, is no longer going to be hostile <coughs> to the possibility. Uh, but more than that, for the U.S., it's a credibility issue. And so at this time, the president has a little bit of a honeymoon coming out of the election. Uh, the, the wonderful speeches that he's been given, the tone that's changed. Uh, but uh, every single uh, time now that he goes on the air or makes a statement, if there is no significant progress that is felt on the ground, mm -hmm. it's going to cost credibility more and more and more. And once you lose that, it's very hard to win back. And uh, let's face it, uh, resolving a Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not exactly an easy job, which means that it's going to require a lot of people giving you, uh, being somewhat patient with you, giving you a little bit of trust, uh, particularly in the implementation project, giving you a little bit of leeway uh, if they, if they if just believe that you're trying to do it. If you start losing that, you've got nothing left. And so, so the issue of time isn't just we need to have an agreement within a particular time. We need to have now from, from particularly the power speech, from now on in a way, uh, the pressure is on to start delivering some of the goods. And the, you mentioned Gaza. It's not just, you know, sort of the negotiations. That's part of it. But the humanitarian issue. I mean, this president has been sensitive to Gaza. He said that publicly. He, he said it in the presence of Israeli prime minister. But the fact remains that the Gaza, there's no structural change in Gaza. And, and I think uh, we've had a very important a conference that uh, Secretary of State Clinton uh, uh, chaired in, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh early on uh, that pledged significant amounts of money, significant amounts of money to, to Gaza. Uh, um, and that was a success. But remember, the Bush administration had many such pledges and conferences. Uh, the problem is that there was no follow through, and when there was no follow through, there was credibility. So this pressure is on on this administration to start delivering very early on. So I echo what Sidney said, it wasn't a real deadline that the president set. Um, in fact, I think 
if one thinks back to it and he says that by the end of the year you'd like to make an assessment to see how things are going, I wouldn't have see that as a concession to anyone. I was really hoping that he wouldn't have that assessment in December, and hopefully one in November and one in January, etc. So this should be an ongoing process. Um, but what I think is quite important there is to see that a lot of these deadlines, some of them one can say are depending on technical progress from the nuclear program in Iran, some are because of the political uh, uh, timetable, you know, by uh, first state of the union, it would be very good for the president to be able to show something that he's been able to get uh, through the negotiations with Iran. Something small, obviously not a solution per se, but uh, some uh, steps forward. But at the end of the day, it's all about creating political space. If there isn't any progress, there's going to be a quick uh, effort to close that political space and uh, impose on the president very, very tight deadlines. Uh, if, on the other hand, there is not only progress uh, on the ground, but also efforts in Washington to remind everyone that after 30 years of non-communication, after more than 20 years of sanctions that have produced absolutely nothing when it comes to changing Iranian behavior, how can we possibly have the expectation that diplomacy would resolve everything that sanctions did not resolve in 20 years, diplomacy will resolve in 12 weeks? It's absolutely unrealistic. And that again necessitates that groups that are in support of the president's agenda are there, active, strong, and make sure that when it comes to creating peace in the Middle East, when it comes to making progress uh, with Iran, patience is going to be one of the key ingredients that we're going to be needing. Not in a naive way, given the Iranians all the time that they need to progress in the nuclear program, but in the way of realizing that we don't set up lines in the sand for ourselves that will guarantee failure. Remember the last time people were pushing for very, very strict deadlines? That was back in 2002. And that was about Iraq. And you all saw what happened with that. This time around, we need to have a much more realistic view. We need to realize that uh, there's going to be uh, a tremendously complicated effort to negotiate. And most importantly, time will be needed to be able to resolve some of these different issues. What we need to see is progress uh, as we go along. It's going to take one step forward, two steps back at times, sometimes two steps forward, one step back. But that process needs to have the political insulation to be able to go on. And that is something, again, that I think groups like yours can provide. Thank you, Trio. Let's, let's just stay with you for a moment for uh, uh, what I hope is a cluster of questions on related issues. We have an embarrassment of riches up here. We have a very engaged uh, and lively audience. We'll try to group the questions uh, and uh, I haven't seen so many different kinds of handwriting uh, since I was in elementary school. So we're sitting with us uh, here. Um, some comments on the threat, realistically, uh, that an Iranian nuclear weapon or a breakout program might have to Israel. We hear uh, a great variety of things. Um, how serious is Iran's uh, threat, this question says, to annihilate Israelis? Under what circumstances might uh, Iran use a nuclear weapon? How rational is the Iranian leadership? How sensitive to civilian casualties of their own are they? What would be a realistic assessment? Uh, there's a lot of questions. How much time do we have? Let me start off with the nuclear issue. I think we have to remember one thing. Um, Preventing Iran or any other country that is a signatory of the NPT uh, from acquiring nuclear weapons is an absolutely just cause because by signing the NPT, Iran has forsaken nuclear weapons. So that is, in my view, not a line that should in any way, shape, or form be compromised. However, uh, the details are in the pudding, as they say, because we have unilaterally tried to change the definition of what a nuclear weapon is by reducing it all the way down to having enrichment. The reality is the vast majority of countries in the world view enrichment as being part of what is guaranteed by Article 4 in the NPT. Uh, uh, and as a result, Iran is entitled to having enrichment. In fact, there's several other countries that have enrichment, but they don't have nuclear weapons for that thing. Now, does that mean 
that Iran would master the technology and the know-how of being able to enrich further uh, above 5% all the way up to 90% and create uh, uh, weapons grade enrichment. But newsflash, they already have them. If that was an objective that we wanted to prevent them from having, well, we have to recognize that we failed. They already have this technology, they already have this knowledge. The question is, what can be done at this stage? At this stage, I think there, we need to go back and reassess um, the utility of inspections and verification and ask ourselves this question. What are the best circumstances that can be created that would ensure that even if Iran has the capability, even if it has enrichment, it still will not make the fatal decision of going for a weapons program? keeping them at the threshold, keeping them where Belgium, Sweden, Japan are today, while making sure um, that we have the guarantees, the best possible guarantees to make sure that they are not cheating, they're not having any clandestine programs. Uh, the longer we wait towards moving towards that solution, the pattern has been so far, the more difficult it will be and uh, the more we will lose. Because facts on the ground are changing rapidly in Iran's favor. For every additional centrifuge that they add, their negotiating position strengthens. And I think, again, um, reassessing the utility of inspections and verification would be quite instructive. Because a lot of technical experts that I've spoken to, some of them connected to the IEA, are saying over and over again, suspension of enrichment is actually not a very good instrument if you want to prevent weaponization. The best instrument that you have is to have the additional protocol, the additional protocol plus, and other types of measures because that will give us the eyes and ears uh, to see what the environment are doing. One of the IEA people gave me an example saying that it showed all the different breakout patterns that the may may uh, choose to use if they wanted to go for weapon and saying that under current circumstances, whatever the Iranians would seek to do, the IEA would be able to detect it within 30 to 60 days if it's taking place in the time. With the additional protocol that the Iranians actually used to implement before their case was sent to the Security Council, the IEA would be able to detect it within 24 hours. It's a big difference. That gives confidence. They give us an ability to be able to say, okay, they have it. We may not like that they have that enrichment technology, but we have an ability to be able to see very quickly if they're cheating. And if they are cheating, they would be violating the NPT, and we would not need to have the debate that we're having right now, but that would in and of itself be a smoking gun. And, and uh, harsh measures uh, uh, would be sanctioned. Um, on the question of what they would do about Israel, is there a realistic risk? There is a realistic risk uh, that Israel is facing. Without a doubt. It's not that the Iranians actually use a nuclear weapon that they don't have and they won't have for a couple of more years. But it is that the uh, two things. That the balance of power in the region is already shifting. It would shift even more if Iran would be to recognize as a nuclear capable state. And that would limit Israeli maneuverability. If there is another powerful state in the region that has better relations with the United States, that has new technology, you would not have an Israel that would have the maneuverability to be able to go into Lebanon as it did in 2006 with impunity, impose or do what it did in uh, uh, Gaza, or impose unilateral peace deals on the Palestinians. That's the maneuverability that the Israelis don't want to lose, but it's not an existential threat in and of itself. The existential threat may actually come as a result of some of the hysteria that has been created over this issue. The existential threat may come as a result of the fact that over a couple of years now, there has been a debate in Israel in which people have argued that if you want to have that capability, there will be a mass, a mass exodus of uh, Israelis out of Israel because they would not want to live in Israel uh, if there is another country in the region with nuclear capability. And recent polls by Saudi University show that I think about a quarter of Israelis would move if Iran got the bomb. Why is that an existential threat? Because it exacerbates another problem that Israel has, which is the, the battle of the bedrooms, as they call it, the demographic battle. But that is, in my view, a self-created uh, issue because Israel has been able to live through many 
other things in the past without seeing mass exodus of Israelis. Uh, and I think what you're probably going to be seeing in the next couple of months is an attempt to see how can this debate be reversed? How can Israel walk back from the brink, uh, move out of the corner uh, that it's painted itself in because its own discourse on this matter has turned in to be a major problem for itself, whether Iran gets the capability or not. I'll stop there and try to get back to the other question. I have something to say on this. Um, I, you know, on the Israeli side, I, I think uh, I have to agree with, with uh, Frida on, on the rationality of this and also on the realist about the, the unlikely use of nuclear weapons uh, in, in this particular case, even if Iran was the one. I do believe, though, is don't underestimate the extent to which Israelis have persuaded themselves to an existential threat. Just don't underestimate that. It's, it's real. It's at the public level. It's a level of government. And in some ways, yes, it's entirely psychological, and it is related uh, in, in some ways to the rhetoric, less to, less to real rational assessment, the rhetoric that's come out of Ahmadinejad and elsewhere. But there is a psychology of, of, uh, uh, you know, of an existential threat connected with this issue in, in a way that does, you know, I would say, if you ask me the Israelis, go to war with Iran to preempt Iran's development of nuclear weapons, even with an American opposition, I would say uh, improbable, but not impossible. Uh, improbable, but not impossible. That, that's sort of what I, what, where, where I am on this issue. But to, to register this psychological, if you take the Palestinians or you take the Jordanians, who are practically next door, in some cases literally live literally next door, um, uh, if you ask them about the Iran nuclear option, many of them think it's better that Iran should have nuclear weapons. Obviously, if Iran were to use a nuclear device against Israel, many Palestinians would be killed, um, and many Jordanians would be killed, but that's not the worry they have. It's, it's, it's a different psychology of what the issue is uh, and what it's about. I happen to think, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, uh, the, the, that the nuclear weapon that Iran would have would in some ways preempt some Israeli maneuverability on some uh, on military issues. I'm not sure. I mean, this requires a debate. I don't think we should assume it. Uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, the suggestion that, for example, uh, Israel would not have carried out the Lebanon War in 2006. Uh, I don't think it was the absence of nuclear weapons that, that, that made Israel uh, do it. I, I mean, I don't see how nuclear weapons would have limited Israel's maneuverability on that. Uh, it, so it's not clear to me. I think the question vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis Israel's uh, operations has to do more with strategic assumptions and conventional weapons. In, 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 in 1973, Egypt and, and Syria went to war against Israel knowing that Israel had nuclear capability. Uh, and, and they understood what the consequences were. So I'm not really sure on, on core issues that nuclear weapons significantly alter. Uh, I think it's like more psychological, and I understand it. Uh, but I'm not sure that, uh, that it, it, it limits the maneuverability as much as people say. I think it requires really, in our debate, particularly in the literature of international relations, I think it requires more debate than we have allowed. I think that, that we shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, we're hard pressed to come up with examples or where just the presence of nuclear weapons uh, separate from you know, sort of going against to, to eradicate someone. Uh, but limited war has been always possible uh, with nuclear weapons. And I think limited wars are really the only kind of wars that we're likely to see in, in the Middle East in any foreseeable future. Go, go ahead. I think to raise a very, very good point. I just want to qualify how I do believe that this will have an impact, and Shuma may be absolutely right that the impact may be much less than what the Israeli thinks. I think it's not the nuclear weapons per se. It is the fear in Israel that at some point Iran will present the United States with a Pentagon fleet, and the United States and Iran will make friends, they will have a new relationship, and you will end up in a situation in which the U.S. and Iran are not automatically on the opposite side of each other on the evolution of the region. Which would mean that, uh, particularly if they have a strategic dialogue, and that Iranian concerns are taken into consideration in Washington before Washington makes up its mind about the issues in the region. 
which would then mean that Israel will have to have spent much more resources in convincing the United States to oppose Iran than they currently have to do, mindful of the fact that the U.S. and Iran oftentimes automatically choose to be alone. That will change some of the dynamics in the region. Um, so it's a trickle effect of that. The Israeli fear that if the Iranians go for capability and the United States moves in the same direction as this, for instance, with Pakistan and India, there was a couple of years of sanctions, etc., we essentially just have to accept it and build a relationship with those states. That the trickle effect of that will be very negative for Israel. Okay. Uh, a, um Cluster of questions about American influence on the parties and their ability to persuade them uh, to do what they'd like them to do. Should we primarily, I think, at least first for you, um, what tools does the Obama administration have to pressure Israel to cooperate, uh, to stop the settlements? How could the U.S. encourage the reconstitution of a Palestinian government? Uh, and uh, in relation to the Arab states, uh, what can the U.S. do to persuade uh, initiatives related to the, the Arab League uh, peace initiative? Well, the million dollar question, because obviously that's what the Obama administration is trying to do and, and, and uh, is struggling to do. But I, just, let me just start on that, because that's an important issue. Um, I think that um, the, what, what's on the side of this administration uh, in, in terms of settlement issues that you have a public opinion in America that supports the president on it. We have a Congress that in principle wants to see an end to settlement. Uh, we have constituencies that care about the Arab Israeli issue, including uh, American Jews, uh, who uh, support uh, the, the need for uh, for increasing the settlement program. So, in some ways, the president is starting from a very, very strong uh, ground. He has, he has uh, domestic support on this issue, he has congressional support on this issue. Notice that, by the way, uh, how a little opposition he has had so far in taking such a tough position uh, across the board. I mean, this is really interesting to see, and, and I think it, it tells you how much and, and, and even in Israel, as you know, most Israelis have not supported settlement activities. So you have a government that does. And in some ways, what makes it uh, complicated for the, for the Netanyahu administration is that that's a government of choice. Uh, it's a government of choice. Uh, it's not a government of necessity. Uh, and what, is it, what do I mean? I mean, uh, there is another party that actually even won more seats than, uh, than the Likud in, in, in the Knesset that uh, is supportive of, uh, you know, limiting the settlement expansion uh, that is uh, not part of, uh, of, of the coalition and certainly Mr. Netanyahu could choose to go to them. And so in, in a way, um, you have an environment in which the president has um, a, a lot more freedom to make settlement an issue. Uh, what that's how, how might this be implemented? Uh, I imagine the administration has a, you know, all kinds of things that, that are under consideration. But I should say that my worry, of course, is this, that uh, while settlement is absolutely important, and just like, you know, if, if you have settlement building and if you have violence ongoing, you know, you, you can't have any kind of peace process. And you have, both of these have to obtain to, to have confidence and to, to buy your time. But if we make the settlement issue the only issue, uh, and then we sort of see if we, we negotiate it and seem to win it down the road, uh, and then there's an expectation of something in return, uh, then I'm not sure, because settlement, you, you can't have settlement be the only strategy. It has to be a component of a broader strategy. What we're after, what we must be after, what we need to have in the next uh, four years uh, now three and a half years, uh, is uh, an agreement that would end the conflict in Israel and Palestinians uh, and give a rise to the Palestinian state. Uh, if we don't have that, I think we're in trouble. Uh, so settlement cannot be, I, I, I think we have to, to, to not make settlement the only issue because I think settlement is a, an important component of stop the climate. With the uh, Palestinian unity government, I think this administration has been very clear 
and it has not proposed in principle of state immunity government. And it has not discouraged our governments from trying to mediate as an after the Bush administration. What it has not done is change the conditions for that government, which is still the quartet conditions. Um, obviously, uh, there's different views on this. Uh, when I wrote the, uh, co-authored the recommendation for the CFR Brookings uh, report uh, for the new administration, uh, recommendations for the new administration, we suggested that we should differentiate between the government's position and the government's position. And on the government, national unity government, we should require that they accept the Arab peace plan, which would be the, the foundation of, the, of, of negotiations. Um, that's not the view so far of the, of the Obama administration, and, and there are good reasons for it. Um, and, and you know, I don't know how this is going to evolve. On the Arab side, it's very, very um, tough to see how you're going to have major Arab initiatives unless we have uh, a, uh, a, some, some revived uh, negotiation. Uh, in part because what, in, in the end, Arab states have to be there. They have to be there for a variety of reasons. They have to be there because um, the Palestinians themselves lack enough leverage uh, on their own. Uh, so the Arab, in a way, is a lure for the Israelis uh, to, to say, uh, if you have peace with the Palestinians, you're also going to have peace with everybody else in the Arab world. That's important. But it's also important because the issue of Jerusalem, as we know, is central. I think Camp David, too, will last more over Jerusalem than anything else. And in the end, Palestinians alone cannot sell the issue of Jerusalem. If you read reports of this past week, uh, you know, in essence, Arab states are telling the Obama administration, uh, look, the Palestinians can decide for themselves on the refugee issue, on the borders issue, but on Jerusalem, they don't decide at all. And so in that sense, it's very important uh, for this administration to find a way of bringing uh, the Arab states along in the process. Thank you, and we're just about out of time, but there is a lot of concern out in the audience, Trita, for the resolution coming on the House floor tomorrow. Uh, can you give us any details, the bill number, what can uh, individuals uh, or others do to uh, try to change this? Is there any way to stop it? And then after that, I'm going to ask you each uh, a one-word question answer. Let me, let me just ask you the one-word uh, answer uh, now. There are a lot of requests here for additional information. Where is the website where people could turn to find uh, the results of your polling? First of all, I apologize because I, I have had to put a beating on hold to, to stay here beyond 10 o'clock and I, I said absolutely 10 15, so I have to rush out. I apologize. Uh, but uh, the, the poll results to, are to be found at uh, SADAT, S A D A T, dot U M D, at University of Maryland, dot edu. We have them posted right there, the poll results. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. And if you heard that, uh, some more details about the sanctions. Uh, it's called HR 1327. It is the Sanctions Enabling Act of 2009. What it does is that it permits states to begin divesting in companies that may have